Hi, welcome to episode 12 of our podcast. I'm Alex, one half of The Sober Experiment. And I'm Lisa, the other half of The Sober Experiment. And today we've got Simon Chapel with us. Author of The Sober Survival Guide and founder of Be Sober. Hi Simon, thanks for coming on. It's lovely to speak to you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So how was your holiday? (laughs) Yeah, I had a great time. I went to Valencia and it was 19 degrees and I wasn't freezing cold, which when you've got no hair, obviously is a... A nice thing. <laughs> and I just went out there to watch um, watch a football match and just have some me time. Spent a bit of time writing my second book, and yeah, it was just fun. I only went. I was only out there for four days, but it was a, a nice break. Thanks. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> well, I, I'm in, actually intrigued now. Um, yeah, uh, forget the questions. Tell us about this second book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've so I'm about halfway through. Um, a, a second book uh, the first one has been selling so well and loads of people have given me some amazing feedback about it particularly about how easy it is to read how digestible how kind of quickly it gets to the bits that people want to hear rather than some a quit alcohol book so it can be a lot of work and, and yeah. kind of go in and they've definitely got their place and uh, and actually some of those really helped me but i wanted to keep mine quite light and make it easy for the reader to yeah. take action and get to the bits that they really want to hear so I've, yeah i've had some great feedback about it but i i always also wanted to do a kind of workbook style book so one where it's over a period of days maybe 60 days um, I've kind of got it at about 50 days so far. You read a chapter a day and each day there's exercises, not not burpees, um, actual exercises for the reader to complete. So it might be exploring your beliefs about alcohol or looking at how life might be and just your core values, things like that. And just really examining yourself and your relationship with drinking and, and your kind of wider self in more depth. So the the first half of the book, which is 25 days, 25 chapters that I've done leads the reader up to a point where they make a decision to either take a break from drinking or to throw the book away and carry on drinking or, or, or whatever it might be. And then the second half of it then walk, will walk them through, hold their hand through a 30 day or whatever break they choose to take um, step by step. And hopefully by the end of it, people will be able to reevaluate their relationship with drinking and make a decision about how alcohol fits in their lives. So it's hard work. It takes so long. Oh, it, it sounds does. fantastic. It, it kind of sounds like that should have been your first book, Simon. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I, so I work with a, a writing coach called um, Ginny Carter, and she's amazing. She's had books published herself, and she basically corrects my spelling errors. And she, oh, you need one. Ginny said to me exactly that. She said, this feels like it should be the first book because the second book is very much how, well, how to quit, but also how to survive all the challenges that come up over the longer term. Whereas this one is very much that exploration of, of self and the relationship with booze and really get into a place where you, you take a break, you make a change. So yeah, you're right. It should have been. <laughs> so is it like at the beginning... Um, you can kind of start this while you're still drinking, so at like the curiosity stage. Yeah, exactly that. And it says at the start, you know, if you are still drinking right now as you're reading this, you don't have to stop now. You know, later on, yes, I'll ask you to make a decision around taking a break. But if you are drinking now, just do it mindfully. Start to record how much you're drinking. Start to um, become curious about it. Nothing more. Right. I really like that. Um, another book quite sim- that has similar theme is Alan Carr's Easy Way to Quit Smoking and Drinking, isn't it? That he doesn't yeah. ask you to stop straight away. And I, both of them really, really helped me, especially the smoking one. Like I stopped smoking eight years ago. And the fact that he told me that I didn't have to stop straight away. Well, you wouldn't have done if it is said you had to. No, well, that's what I mean. And I wouldn't. And it was like I was getting further and further into the book and thinking, I can't wait to stop. And I think if you've got that, I just think it's 
going to be brilliant. I'm really looking forward to reading that. I might have to read it anyway, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I'll send you a draft of it if you want, and you can give me your opinion before oh, you do it. For all, by all means. Oh, I've got some now, cover design. on audio, though, because she's going to make me read it. <laughs> You know, that's another thing. I haven't so obviously that's the first one, and I haven't um I haven't done an audio book, and it was a decision of do I record the audio book, which takes forever, or do I start writing the one that I've got in my mind and I'm really excited to do? And of course I've started doing the second one. And I have had quite a few people say to me, Where's where's the audio book? I, I need the audio book. I want to listen to it in the car when I'm driving to work or whatever. Yeah. And it, it really is a a tough job and I don't want to I don't want someone else to record it I feel I need to record it myself yeah, definitely I agree with that we met somebody actually at um, a networking event yeah and he'd submitted this whole book and we won't say his name because it's unfair and just listen to our podcast <laughs> but um he'd sub- submitted this whole book he was really excited about it and it got rejected because he said he was too animated because apparently you've got to speak quite monotonally all the way through blimey but yeah mine will get rejected for sure then <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but yeah, that's what he said, that he'd been rejected, didn't he? Yeah. Mind you, he was really animated, though, not like your average animated person. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, though, because it's the... It, I did do the first couple of chapters, uh, and it's the time and the the reading of it, it, as you say, in a certain way, with a certain tone, and not going off script, so to speak, as well. You know, when I talk you want to sort of talk naturally and just go with the flow but you're sticking to a script so I can see why it is quite a specialist thing and you know I ended up doing multiple retakes and not really getting very far with it so it's a work in progress is what I tell people oh well I look forward to that Simon because I'm all about audible you're quite happy to read them aren't you both yeah, yeah yeah I do both and then she'll say oh have you read this and I go no no you haven't read it don't don't ask me if I've read have you listened you mean have you listened to <laughs> <laughs> so Talking about going off script, I was obviously there for um, the Mindful Drinking Festival. And <laughs> sure, honestly, I saw so many talks on that day and yours was just lovely. So, oh, thanks. When Matt, you, you, did, you said yourself, didn't you, you'd gone off script and you'd gone over what you wanted to do? Yep, I did, absolutely. I, I, I know. How genuine you were. Oh, thanks. I yeah, I do try and speak from the heart. And I think that, I, and I actually think that's one of the reasons that quite a lot of people have connected with me and sort of resonate with some of the things I say. I don't mean that like in a kind of big headed way, like all loads of people connect with me, but I, I just think people see that he's a normal guy. He's, you know, he's quit drinking and he's, he's achieved things like getting a book out and building a Facebook group and a community um, without all the, ego that sometimes comes with those kind of things and I th- um and when they hear your my story uh, yeah I just tell it like it is really and sure I get emotional and I cry sometimes it was lovely it really was and you know I loved the bit about and this is what we wanted to talk to you a little bit about really is from your perspective parenting because both of us are parents um and we've had our different challenges we've got an age range of three to 21 in 22 pretty much, um, in age range. Um, so we have very different parenting challenges, but one thing that we haven't heard a lot of on our podcast is dad's perspectives and male yeah. perspectives. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's a big topic as well. Um, yeah. And the other thing I was just going to say about that talk as well, before we jump onto parenting is, um, so my slot was 20 minutes and there was 10 minutes in between speakers and, I'd practiced and practiced and practiced my talk. It had never gone over 21 minutes. And I could see the lady who runs it out of the corner of my eye getting closer and closer to the stage. And I thought, well, there's no way. I know, I know this is you know, 20 minutes. And it was 20, nearly 27 minutes. And, uh, yeah, and I just, I don't know how. And I, I just got lost in the notes and I just kind of gave up on them in the end and just went with the flow. And I, although I came off it feeling like it was a, a whirlwind and I didn't sort of have a sense of euphoria of, oh, that went so well. All the feedback I've had afterwards was actually, it, it was the real you and you didn't stand there like a robot. People could see a, a vulnerable person that they could connect with. And, and that's nice. That's lovely. And I actually think I'd rather that kind of come across like that. Anyway, back to parenting. Before you go on to parenting though now, because I just want to add to that because I watched 
and I saw and it 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 was one of the best I saw if not the best and I think it's it's because you didn't carry on with your script and you just became human and you became vulnerable and all those things but I don't know if you realize just how good you are on the stage you just you just own it you've got a presence and I don't mean that to sound patronizing in any way it was just really it just took me right in it wasn't a moment where I thought come on Simon you, you really don't yeah, you're sharp, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she does do that I was going to say the same because I watched you on stage in Denver at the with Annie Grace and I was thinking exactly the same you didn't thing. go to Denver though no, oh, yeah. no I didn't I wasn't there I watched it on oh, I wish you were I wish we were as well <laughs> we'll come next time <laughs> but yeah, I'm talking there in September you. I'm doing it again oh, yeah. Really? yeah there's an exclusive for you because no one knows they do now oh we like oh, an exclusive we do, we do. <laughs> I love to say we've got gossip. <laughs> but yeah, I, the stage presence and I think like what you said, the vulnerability and you just come across as so normal and you and it's just lovely to watch. It really, really is. But that's enough now. <laughs> no, no, I'm not having any more compliments now. We're done. If you could keep going, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. No, thank you. We'll be able to get away with the door, Simon, if we carry on. We don't want you banging <laughs> your head again. <laughs> no, that's true. No, in fact, it means a lot. That's really kind. <laughs> so can you then talk to us a little bit about um, your parenting in terms of like, you know, from, from a dad's perspective, how has stopping drinking helped you and what kind of challenges have you had to face? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's absolutely huge to me. I, when I was drinking, I did used to put alcohol ahead of my son in a big way. I mean, I can remember it where, especially when he was younger, so he's 15 now, but when he was kind of, before he was a teenager, um, and I suppose I had more of a level of control over him, I, I would just want him out of the way in the evening so I could dig into the wine and it would just be, you know, he's, he's off the bed, he's in his room, just get the Shiraz out and drink, drink, drink. And I would actually... And I, I hate saying it, but I would actually kind of get a bit annoyed if he perhaps come back into the living room when I was sat there trying to drink and do my thing during my time. Yeah. Um, so there's that aspect of it while I was actually drinking. But then there's all the other things. For example, the number of times that my wife we were funny we were looking at core values recently around what lights us up in our lives and one of my wife's she didn't even need to write it down is family now to i don't come from a big family i'm a i'm an only child and so fa families to me is not as important because i've never had a big family it's kind of me and my mum and um and my stepdad but my wife, Michelle, comes from a, a big family and and family is so important to her. She loves doing family things. And I can remember so many times where I would make excuses and refuse to do things either as a family, my wife, me and my son, or with the wider family because I wanted to drink or because I had a hangover and just didn't feel like it. You know, even if it was taking our son bowling or going to a fireworks event at the school or whatever. You know, if that event went past eight o'clock, which was my wine time, I, I started to get tetchy about it and wanted to be back here. And but at the time I was in that bubble and I never really gave it much thought. But now I look back on that, I can see how damaging it was. You know, my son's been dragged away from his friends because dad wants to get home for eight. Yeah, dad's saying it's for his dinner, but it's actually so he can drink his wine, you know? I don't think you realise at the time, you know, I think a lot of mums are the same with that, aren't they? You know, it's like, get the kids in bed, get the kids in bed and we'll have a glass of wine or, oh, go to your room. So, but at that time, you do not realise that you're doing that. It's not till afterwards you look back and reflect on it. And like you said, you're thinking, oh, no, I feel bad saying this, but this is what I used to do. And I think so many people do this and don't I think even realise. most people are doing it. Most people who drink um, at a set time are doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, and then obviously after I was able to, to quit and find freedom from alcohol. Yes. What I quickly realised, yeah, uh, what I quickly realised was how much more present and engaged I am with my son, with my wife, and the 
actually wanting to listen to what he's got to say and being genuinely interested rather than my mind being slightly pulled in a different direction was eye-opening because I'd never been like that before. And, and when he asks, can we do something together, I actually feeling excited and passionate about wanting to do that thing with him. So, you know, uh, and it's, it has changed our relationship. You know, it's completely turned it around. I used to bicker with him. I used to be snappy and unreasonable, which then resulted in him being like that with me. And yeah, you know, once you start, it kind of escalates, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So there, there, there was a lot of that. And he's, he's a sensitive kid as well. So I, I feel like over the years, I've kind of not helped with those sort of things. But the great news is what has happened is our relationships improved. I feel, oh, there's so many things I could tell you about <laughs> this, but I'll just try and stick to a few. But I feel like he's, learned a lot from what I've done with quitting drinking. I mean, as you guys know, and you're the same, we've been really vocal about our stories. We're sharing to help other people, which is an amazing thing. And I love what you do. Um, and I often have people say to me, Simon, you know, Mike, I've drunk for 20 years and my kids have seen me drink every day of my life. I've done the damage, nothing can be changed. And there's, it's, there, nothing could be further from the truth yeah. because he's almost become inspired by me quitting drinking. And I know it sounds so weird. I remember a couple of weeks into me quitting, I downloaded a sober counter app and he came running into the kitchen a, a day or two after I'd shown him it. And he was like, dad, dad, I've downloaded that I am sober app. Oh. I, said, I said, why have you downloaded that? You don't drink booze or <laughs> something you're not telling me. He said, you've given up alcohol. I'm giving up fizzy drinks. And he's still oh. got it on his phone. Yeah, honestly, he's still got it on his phone. He has had a couple of, um, a couple of moments with Dr. Pepper, but... <laughs> A few Dr. Pepper relapses. Oh, yeah, but he, he's learned from them. He's learned from them and he's grown stronger. That's the important thing. Oh, uh, that's amazing. So, so there, and, and I realised when that happened that he's kind of learning from this himself. And I felt like I'd almost shown him, I, I, I helped him understand about alcohol. And I've, I feel like he learned things he could never unlearn. I didn't preach to him. I just had grown up open conversations about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And he's a bright kid. He took it all on board. And then there was a time, of, it was probably middle of last year, he was staying at a friend's house down in the Southwest. And he texted me and he said, Dad, my friend's just got out a bottle of gin and they're drinking it. And he said, I'm not going to have any. I'm not interested and I wouldn't want to let you down. And I was like, it was... It was, it. and then I thought, God, if I hadn't quit drinking, you would have tried that. Yeah. But I also appreciate, and I'm not naive enough to think he probably will explore alcohol. But I feel like, as I say, he's learned things he can never unlearn, and I've, I've he's kind of, I've set him up for success, hopefully, on yeah. his own journey. Yeah, I think you definitely have. It's um, it's a topic that I'm really interested in because my son, he's the same age as your son, and shortly after. I stopped drinking, we went on holiday. And when we came back from holiday, he said, oh, mum, I've recorded a video for you that I want you to see. And he'd record, yeah. it's only really short, but it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. And he's, he's a bit awkward on it, but he's recorded this little video and he, he basically talks about all the positives since I stopped drinking and he wanted to show it me and I was really touched. And again, I'm not naive enough to think that he will never experiment or he will never, you know, go out and get drunk in his later teens or in his early 20s but I do think that by setting that example he will see that actually it doesn't need to get to that point before you make a decision to stop yeah exactly that and that's that's a lovely story for him to do that video I think that that would make me cry I don't know if you know. <laughs> it did make me cry it did yeah that absolutely would um yeah that's really sweet but yeah and you're and this is what I say to people when they feel like irreparable damage has been done. You know, the past is the past, but, you know, kids look up to us. They learn from us. They want to be like us. I wanted to be like my dad. That's why I started drinking yeah. the same wine he drank and thought it was the gateway to adulthood. Yeah. But, yeah, that's amazing. And 
Oh, I suppose the other thing, which again, I touched on this at the Mindful Drinking Festival and I was talking about it, um, is my son's face some challenges around his sexuality and his gender. And I do often think how the drinking Simon would have handled that compared to the sober Simon. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like we've been on a journey together with it and we I've kind of held his hand through it and given him the support he needed. I've been gentle and with him and, you know, he can vent at me or become frustrated, whatever. But the drink in me definitely probably would have, not de- probably, definitely would have buried my head in the sand and just drunk more and been snappy and unreasonable and all the other things. Yeah, we've been to Pride together. We've been to, ex- you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, t- and just on a journey. And it's, I'm trying to reframe the whole thing in his mind as well. Of, instead of it being something frustrating and something that's a challenge, it should be something that's exciting and, and, a, and a journey of self-discovery, just like, Quitting drinking is. Yeah. Oh, you give me goosebumps. <laughs> Do you think, Simon, it would have opened up to you the same had you been drinking? I yeah, I I think he would actually because um, so he's so he's got autism and he's quite he doesn't really think about what the implications of some of his actions are. Yeah. For, for example. Um, When he started at his new senior school, I said to him, look, don't go in the first day and tell everybody that you're gay. Um, It's an all-boys school. Scope it out. There's bound to be other boys. Uh, Get the lay of the land, blah, blah, blah. Um, Leave it a bit. We'll talk, and then we'll come up with a strategy. First day, came home, he told everybody. Um, and, you know, and, again, and again, when he went with the whole gender um, side of things, you know, that was, my wife and I found out by, about that by, via text message. <laughs> so, you know, so I think he would because he wears his heart on his sleeve and he just tells it like it is. However, I do imagine there are other parenting situations where kids may be... Uh, afraid or wary of talking to parents who snap. I mean, fortunately, my wife is like an oasis of calm in a in a massive desert full of sandstorms, Aww. which is me and my son. But however, so I think he's always totally cool and comfortable talking to her about anything. So she's always been that kind of stability element, which is great. But I think, or I hope he sees me much more like that now. I mean, I don't think I'll ever be stable, but I'm as stable as I'm going to be. Well, any of us, Simon. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that brings us nicely on to the next thing that you wanted to talk about. Yes, you've just recently been diagnosed with ADHD, is that right? That is right, yeah. So, I think I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> Alex thinks I I've got it. And since when I saw you'd wrote it on your Facebook page and you was, you know, you've been really open about it and you'd put like some of the things what made you think it. And I was reading down this list of things and I was like, oh, oh, (laughs) oh. I remember being like that, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I messaged Alex and I was like, Alex. I think I might have ADHD. And she was like, you definitely no, have. No, no, what I actually said was, oh, no shit, Sherlock, you definitely have. <laughs> I could have told you that. That's what people used to say to me. People used to say exactly that. Yeah, but nobody you know, said it before. It's, I've had to realise this for then people to kind of go, yeah, I think you have. And I'm like, all right, well, you could have mentioned it. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about this and what made you decide to go and get this test? Yeah, for sure. So the... For I mean, for as long as I can remember, I have been, I've, I rush everything. I rush around. I will, even when I cut, so let's say I come downstairs in the morning, I've just got up, I will fill the kettle up and I'll probably spill the water because so quickly I want to get it back and plugged in <laughs> at the same time as getting the tea bags out, trying to check my emails, trying to open the fridge for the milk and stuff's going everywhere. And it's just kind of chaos because I'm just rushing everywhere. And I will, I, I was telling my mum actually, she came around earlier in the supermarket. I will 
I'd fill my trolley up and the closer I get to the tills, the faster I start to move, even though I'm moving fast anyway. I mean, I don't know why. I don't know what, who I'm trying to be, but, um, <laughs> but it's quite a good example. And then things will irritate me. It could be anything from people driving through to people walking slowly, uh, you name it. Um, mood swings. One minute I'm feeling relatively happy. The next minute it takes just the slightest little thing and I'm in a grump and then I can come back out of it again. Impulsive behavior. You know, I mean, I remember one time um, we were in a, stuck in a traffic jam outside a car dealership and I looked in and I thought, oh, wow, that car looks nice. And I just, we, I told my wife to pull over. We went in and I bought it. I won't tell you how much it was, but it was, it was a lot of money. And it was just impulsive. And the car I've got now, I saw it online. I just phoned the guy up, paid for it over the phone. I just wanted it. Decision made. Um, yeah. yeah, stuff like that is um, a bit, well, it's not great, is it? And so, you, yeah, impulsive behavior. And then hyperactivity. Um, is an interesting one because you can also have something called hyper focus. So hyper focus is where you can immerse yourself into something like writing a book, for example, and you just don't stop until you've got it done. I mean, my wife and I have built a really successful business. We've got 25 staff and it, it does really well. And I'm not involved in it day to day anymore, but I was hyper focused on it when I was. I lived it. I breathed it. I still help out, but I'm not hyper focused on it. And <laughs> and like my be sober group, you know, I I want to have the biggest sober group. I can't just have a. I can't just quit drinking. Put it like that. I want to. I, I, I want to do talks. I want to write books. I want to be something and take it further. I know it's really. I heard you saying this actually. I think it was um, on your Sunday night with Pippa. Um, yes yeah I'm on fire yeah I think and you'd said that you can't just like you say you can't just go sober and I'm a little bit like this like once I went to Slimming World right so and I did really well off it but normal people would go right that's it no not me I decided that that's it I'm going to be a consultant I'm going to be a team developer at it I'm going to live it I'm going to breathe it I'm going to and then once I'd finished with it that was it I'd done now I don't want to do it anymore I'm not talking about it anymore then I stopped drinking so I don't just stop drinking. I convert everybody around me to stop drinking. Yeah. <laughs> and so I kind of, when I heard you say that, I was like, oh my God, that's just me. That's what I feel like. And you're so fidgety. Honestly, she makes me dizzy. I fidget, but she's like this. Girl. Oh my God. I couldn't sit still for, I mean, my wife's here. You can ask her, but I couldn't <laughs> sit still for how long? <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, for like five minutes, she said. But, you know, I honestly, it, sometimes she says to me, oh, I'm just going to sit on the sofa for an hour. And I'm like, how? How do you yeah. do that? That's what I like. I can't understand people that can do it. And like even now talking to you, and I would never notice it. But because me and Alex do so much together and we sat so close to each other, I'm like banging her, I'm messing with my hands. She I'm feels like, my leg on a daily basis I, <laughs> nowadays. It's a good job I'm really comfortable with her because she's always got me my leg and my knee and my arm. And yeah. But I never realised any of this until, well, really until you said, but is this something that you noticed before you stopped drinking? Yeah, so sorry, that was to get to the point, wasn't it? I was just telling you the <laughs> symptoms, yeah. Um, so the, all of that had gone on for years and just like you, people have, when jokes have come up about ADHD or whatever. People have said to me, well, of course you have, it's obvious. But I never really took it seriously. But what had happened, and this is interesting, um, in fact, it's incredibly interesting. So when I quit, my anxiety faded away and it's never come back. And that's amazing. And thank God, because it was awful. But over the last couple of years, the the ADHD symptoms have been more obvious, a lot more obvious. And my wife has really been aware of them much more so than they were before. And I, and a lot, there's a lot of frustration. I mean, one of the classic things that I do is say my wife was going out and she had said to me, I'm going out with my friend tonight. I might stay out. I might come back. That would drive me nuts because I need an answer. Are you or aren't you? 
and I would text her or I'd harass her, multiple messages. Oh. And it's like that with anything that I don't have a straight answer on. And I think what I used to do was I'd feel these feelings of frustration with certain things because it's not a nice place to live in. I wouldn't say I was happy, but it was always okay because I had a bottle of wine in the cupboard and I could look forward to that. And it took the edge off of it all, not necessarily the process of drinking, but just the fact that I could numb, I suppose I knew I could numb out. I could. So I think I was actually subconsciously self-medicating it, even though I hadn't put the pieces together. So, uh, yeah, to them, it, it just has become so much more obvious. It's like because alcohol is not involved, it's like the curtains have been pulled back on it and the, there's no hiding from it. Mm. So, yeah, we talked about it and I thought, well, I'll do a few online tests just to get a feel for it. And they were all over 90% and the scale. So I got my son to do some and, he, and I thought, well, maybe it's the, Maybe it's the tests. They're all like that. <laughs> They're just trying to get you to buy something. And it wasn't. And I got my wife to do them. And same thing. No, hers were, you know, the arrow was down here and mine was up there. And I did three or four of these tests. And I, I, so I thought, I'll post them on Facebook, see what people say. And a lot of people were saying things like, well, of course you have, it's obvious type thing. So, I, yeah, I bit the bullet. I thought, I'm going to go for an assessment. I, I want to know about this and did the assessment, which was about three hours of questions and tests and things like that. And the guy at the end, he said, yeah, normally we will email you this, but I can tell you right now, you've got <laughs> combined ADHD. No way. So how's that changed your kind of um, daily living now that you know? Well, I felt relief that I know what that is. And I... Uh, and I think so did my wife and my son to a degree. My my wife definitely, my son to a degree. The that and they've been so much more understanding around some of the behaviours that come with it, and knowing that it's not me just being annoying. It's, it's, it's I can't help some of these things. Um, but what has changed dramatically is so the doctor um, prescribed me some medication for it. So. I spent four days researching this medication, reading every forum, every blog about every side effect because of the ADHD, I couldn't help it. <laughs> and, it, it, you know, I hyper-focused on it. And, it, and again, this is amazing because this has come through sobriety as well. Somebody from the alcohol experiment who I'm quite friendly with, her daughter's got ADHD and we started talking because she emailed me when she saw my status and her daughter has the same medication and she told me her daughter's experience of it and she said, Simon, you should try it. Don't hold back. And it was when I spoke to her, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to treat this as an experiment just like I encourage people to do with alcohol. Yeah. So I started taking the tablets and every day I've been journaling my experience so that when I go back to the doctor, I can we can review it together and I can look back and say, well, you know, these are the good things. These are the questions. These are the bad things. And my God, the first day I took it, it was like somebody had flicked a switch. I've nothing has irritated me since I started taking it. Nothing seems to be able to phase me or stress me out. And I just feel like somebody's turned my speed dial down from 10 to four. Really? You're going for an assessment. I'm paying for it. <laughs> the funny thing is, these tablets are actually amphetamine based. But, really? Yeah. So, but when you've got ADHD, it has the reverse effect. It's it kind of just slows things down and it rebalance. It gets your dopamine levels where they should be. So, if I gave one of those tablets to my wife, she would be high and bouncing yeah. off the walls. Whereas it actually just slows me down it calms me down but it, it's so funny like I, I was at the airport obviously the trip to Valencia and airport to me is an absolute trigger for irritability yeah. stress and I just feel like I'm just I just sort of breeze through stuff now and it just, just nothing phases me it's just like a sort of go with the flow thing I can't it's hard to describe but it's incredible I can see that, I think, with you. By just you talking about it, you can see, can't you, that um, yeah. how much better you do actually feel. Uh, it, it's just an amazing... It, it, it is life-changing. And I just... It is early days because I've only been on them for three weeks, two, two or three weeks. But 
you know, I, I can't believe I've lived all that time not knowing what normal felt like, but it's all part of the learning process. We were having a conversation earlier, actually, on similar lines where, you know, both of us are really extreme in personality. So um, we went out on Friday night and we were both on a real high. Saturday morning comes, we're both on a real downer. And both of us would have put that down to the beer fear thing before. Yeah. But actually, I've just realised that, you know, this is my natural personality. I'm an up, down, up, down person. And I haven't yet found an even keel. And I said to Lisa, what if this is just being alive what if this is what it's meant to feel like and actually all we were doing before with alcohol is just keeping ourselves flat we have no idea whether we're just meant to be this way yeah it's so weird isn't it like when you came in before because we are either up or down so like Alex walked in I was like oh I feel really down today she's like yeah I do as well it's just yeah all right now yeah, right, I, I think you've cheered us up, Simon. Yeah, you have. <laughs> right, there you go. The, the, I'm good for something. Oh. And, then, that, and again, that's a really good point because I wrote a blog post about um, dealing with emotions without the false armour of alcohol. And I remember the first time that something happened in my life that you know, really was painful and hurt and made me cry and I had to mm-hmm. feel those emotions without knowing that I could reach for a bottle of wine to numb it all out. Mm. And yeah, that's hard. But it was also a new feeling and a new experience. But not only could I feel them, I could also go through them and out the other side of them rather than put the pause button on them and they're still waiting for me the next morning. I felt like I almost could self-close them, get closure on them. Yeah, it's like self-healing, isn't it? I remember yeah. doing the same when I found out my my dad had passed away, um, not long into me stopping drinking. And I've not seen him for ages. And I spoke about this the other day. It brought quite a few different feelings of guilt and sadness. And I remember just sat in the car and I pulled over and cried and cried and cried. And that would have been a time where normally I would have suppressed that and gone and got a bottle of wine and gone out and turned from being sad into the life and soul. And I'd have just put it away for years. But instead, I did exactly that. I felt it. I thought about it and kind of came out the other side. It's. I think it's a bit like, I mean, I've... I mean, I know quite a few kind of counsellors and I've done sessions obviously with some counsellors and none of them told me I had ADHD, by the way. But, <laughs> uh, but it's a bit, I think it's a bit like a, we've got this kind of filing cabinet in our heads and when you have an experience, an awful experience like that and you deal with it properly and work through it, you know, the file goes away in the cabinet. The memory is dealt with, you've got closure. But when they're not dealt with, it's almost like the file's been scattered over the floor and yeah. it's an unresolved memory that can come back and, and uh, de- uh, cause problems in, in many different ways. But I definitely feel that too. And I, I, I definitely cry more these days. I don't know if it's because yeah. I'm a big girl, but the, you know, I, I definitely do do that. But I think that's because I feel like I'm in check with my emotions as who I am. But you laugh more as well, though. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I do. I laugh more. I'm more engaged and more present. I, don't, I remember a time when I did, I genuinely felt like I was destined to become a grumpy old man. I just didn't Aww. smile. I didn't laugh. And that was kind of what I thought it was, that life was. And I just cannot imagine that version of his No. no. It wasn't there. A, I'll ask my <laughs> wife. Tell them how grumpy I was. Miserable <laughs> believe you we want you and your wife on our next podcast together yeah she won't come on the camera she's hiding around the corner but and how much have i changed 100 percent no literally oh that's amazing amazing so i bet it's been quite a journey for your wife as well really hasn't it do you want to say something if you don't want to (laughs) come on come and tell us (laughs) (laughs) she sat here on facebook it has been quite a journey for her and uh yeah, we did actually do a, a YouTube video, which I had to bribe her with some, I can't remember if it was handbag or shoes, but um, but where we talked about how it feels for your partner it's when bit, yeah. you quit drinking. It was one of the most viewed videos on my YouTube channel. And so many people related to it and 
uh, saw it from a, a different perspective. So I do appreciate you doing that. And it would be nice if you'd come on, but... <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, of course. <laughs> no, it's, it, it is a lovely story to hear. And you know what, as well? I want everybody who doesn't follow you, or everybody in our groups, any anyone who doesn't know about you, they've got to find you because you are such an inspiration. So tell them. Tell them where they can find you and how they can get hold of you, Simon. Oh, yeah, sure. So... My Facebook group, which is a huge community of people from all around the world who are changing their relationship with drinking. Now, there's people who want to quit, people who have quit, people who've quit for decades in there, whole whole mixed bag of people. Um, that If you search Be Sober, B-E Sober in Facebook, it's the first group that comes up. Uh, you know, join the group, it's totally free. Um, when you join there's an option to put your email address in and I can send you the first 10 chapters of my book for free. Um, but so that, yeah, I just kind of give that as a, as a welcome kind of thing. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, which is at be sober and quit, which I was late to the party with Instagram. I really was. You know, I've just done everything on Facebook for years and I only actually started using Instagram as a kind of community or a bit, yeah, building a community probably about eight months ago, but I'm, I'm active on it now and really? try and share. And I try and share different things on there to what we share on the Facebook pages. Then there's the Be Sober website, which is besober.co.uk. I put regular blog posts on there and videos from the YouTube channel as well. I think the most useful thing about the website is all of the old blog posts because they're from the early days when I quit and people can just read it, warts and all, spelling errors and all, just how it was at that time for me. And I think that a lot of those have resonated with people around, you know, because yeah, I was putting a post on how it feels on day four, day five, and you know, things like that. Uh, and the ups, the downs, the you know, the tears, the smiles, all the rest of it, you know, they're, they're all on there. So I, I feel like there's, it's like a library for someone who wants to quit drinking. You need that in the early days as well, because I think when you're quite far into it, people will ask me now, or we see yeah. people in the early days, and I can't remember how I felt, or because I'm in such this good place with sobriety now. And I sometimes type my own name in a Facebook group that I was in, <laughs> yeah. not to see my old posts. To That's a good idea. Them. Because I really used them in the early days, the Facebook groups. I think they were they were essential for me and just to get things off my chest and share my story. Yeah, right, me too. So I just type it in and think, oh, look where we were at day 30. Oh, it's really good. Yeah, absolutely. And the, yeah, the Facebook groups are great. Uh, yeah, so I feel like I've kind of built this library of content that is out there for anyone to use as they wish. You know, everything from my first holiday sober, going to a wedding, all the rest of it. I always tried to give it, I mean, I don't know if you've heard the phrase HRT, it's not the hormone replacement therapy, <laughs> but you know, everything I, whenever I do anything, and I, I don't actually do it consciously, but I always, Annie taught me this, I always try and make sure that people have hope so that there's a hope of change and you can see that there'll be something better from this. And then the R is to try and build a relationship with people. You know, if people feel they can connect with me and see, wow, he's just like me. You know, it's yeah. a normal person. And then T is tactics. And actually when I write a piece of content, putting tactics in there. So, you know, great. Yeah. All this stuff sounds wonderful. Tell me how to do it. Yeah. So I always try and do that as well. You know, make it simple. You know, this is how I did that. This, this was what worked for me and this was what didn't. And that's what the second part of your book is really about, isn't it? Because yeah. um, it really helped me, actually, because I had not done, I think it was, was it Sober Wedding or Sober Dance? It was Sober something, I don't know what it was, but there was definitely, I mean, you even talk about sober relationships and everything and the raunchy stuff. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, that was hard to write, that one. Yeah, well. <laughs> Do you want to I, jump on now, Michelle? <laughs> Tell them about that one. Definitely Jesus, one. that was like losing my virginity all over again. <laughs> actually read that and thought oh how brave I think I might try and write a post like that but anyway I never have <laughs> yeah that's a that's a tough a tough topic do you know a, a lot of people find that 
the sober sex thing can be a real barrier and something that sends them back down the rabbit hole of drinking. But you you need to be gentle with yourself. You know, the first time I did, I was really scared. Like the first time I had sex without drinking, I'm not afraid of talking about it. And um, yeah, it was, it was tough. And I remember actually having a conversation with Michelle about how I felt and actually saying to her, you know, I was, oh my God, I was going to say be gentle with me. It sounds like she beats me up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be gentle. <laughs> Let's not go down this road. But, but, yeah, emotionally. Yeah, but, you know, be, be gentle. <laughs> Simon, get your words yeah, out. So, I'll, so after she put the whip away and was gentle with me, <laughs> but, but I, you know, so in all seriousness, I, I needed that. I, you know, it was it was tough to, and it, and it felt scary. I think the best description is it was like losing your virginity again. I think but it's good to hear that though from a man's perspective because I, I think as a woman, you just think it's kind of easy for men, and they just do it anyway do you know what you I mean? do well, you do you don't realize how much emotions attached to it for most men do you no because women are quite you know with the self-conscious and but you do think that's just a women a woman thing yeah don't you, do. you? you do but the, and when we talked about it as well we kind of actually tried to work out the last time we'd done it without booze involved yeah and we couldn't even think of when that time was. So I'd relied on it that much for confidence. You know, it just became a thing. We, yeah, you drink and then, you know, you do, you might have sex. And so, yeah, it was, it was tough. And the first, I'd say the first couple of times were a t- like eye opening. And the first time was definitely scary. But after that, it was the same thing as a lot of the other things we experience in terms of being fully present, the connection, the sensation, all of it was on a, actually a heightened level because my senses weren't dulled and I wouldn't have it any other way. And you can remember it in the morning. Sometimes you don't want to, I guess, but, <laughs> yeah, but you can remember things. I can was, just imagine Michelle's face in the corner there. Like, Stop! You should see I'm, it. Shut up, shut up, Simon! <laughs> you should see it, Yeah. She's like, oh, stop, stop, change the subject. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a really good subject because I do think it makes people uncomfortable and awkward. And, you know, I got sober and my husband stopped drinking to support me. So we had to both have sober sex. And I don't think it was so much of an issue for him. But for me, yeah, it's like you say, I was like, oh, my God, I'm actually, you're in the moment. And it's like, I felt really uncomfortable. And this is a man that I've been with for years, you know, I felt yeah. really uncomfortable. Oh, my God, he's going to be looking at this part or touching this part or. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Exactly that. Uh, def- the first time for me, I definitely wouldn't say I enjoyed it and I wouldn't want to, you know, what? give. No, <laughs> not the first time. <laughs> Ignore that voice in the corner. That's what I told her. <laughs> but from there on in, like I, w- I honestly wouldn't have it any other way. And it's you know it's just be- and then I mean again I don't can't believe we've ended up on this topic. But the 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 other thing, of course, from a guy's perspective, is like losing an erection if you drink too much and that's yeah that used to happen sometimes i almost knew where the line was there was a line between it being okay and then you're over the edge yeah and i almost knew where it was and sometimes i drink too much and it was useless so that that's another point and and then you've also got the other element which I don't think I ever did, but you know, of sometimes if you drink too much during, a, especially if it's somebody you're not haven't been with like for a long, long time, and you don't know, you m- might overstep boundaries yeah. or do something that actually is not cool, and you think because you're not really in, fully engaged and fully present that it's okay, or you know they're cool with that, and actually they're not. So it can lead to all sorts of things especially if you're really drunk. Yeah, I think legally as well, especially for people who aren't in a relationship and might be going home for a one-night stand or whatever, you're in a really grey area when you're drunk about consent and it's a really dodgy place to get. Yeah, and it's becoming you know, more and more significant and you know, the, the whole consent thing, and absolutely it should be. Ah, yeah. So I, you know, I completely agree. That, you know, Often I imagine people wake up and they don't know who or what or why or how it all started in the first place. 
They do. And you know, just us going out on Friday night oh, into yeah. Manchester. And you said it, didn't you? Yeah. On the way back to the car. I said it's just so dangerous. Like, I've never noticed yeah. that before. But because we was in town and you could see, like, women girls. and girls on their own, um, staggering st- around and yeah. slumped up against walls or, yeah. or, you know, doing things that they perhaps, well, they wouldn't do. And you can see in their eyes. And I just thought, you know, it is just so ridiculously dangerous. Yeah, I agree. And we have put each other and ourselves in that position yeah. where we've not fully known what you're doing. And worse still, because of the loss of inhibition, you no longer care what you're doing. Yeah, all the that was the other thing I didn't mention. I'm glad you said that. Absolutely. You've lost those inhibitions, so you yeah. might end up sleeping with somebody that you don't even fancy, you don't even like. You yeah. know, and doing it on the first night when you didn't really want to. So, yeah, it's it's definitely something that, I think people should explore and if they feel that you know after that first time second time it you know it still feels tough you know stick with it it took me a couple of goes to kind of get where I wanted to be <laughs> yeah, clearly you had similar experiences as well yeah, yeah absolutely we did and um, yeah I think on that note we're kind of um, <laughs> we're kind of done now is, is there anything we haven't asked you that you want to share or talk about I think I've pretty much shared my entire life story yeah, now so haven't I, I actually <laughs> This will be our most listened to podcast. Time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. If this one doesn't go viral, I don't know what, <laughs> what you need to do. No, that's it. You've uh, you've just uh, shot us off to fame, the three of us now. That's it. We're made for life, Simon. To be honest, I, I just, you know, on a serious yeah. note, though, I, I, I think you know this already, but I do like to be out there. You know, guys don't talk about certain topics enough. Yeah. And I feel like kind of, honoured that I've got a big community and people seem to like some of the things I share and some of the things I have to say, which, you know, makes me feel kind of humble, if I'm honest. So I, I want to talk about the thorny stuff and the things that are difficult, whether that's ADHD, sober sex, yeah. parenting, whatever. And, I, and particularly from a male perspective, a lot of guys, you know, especially when they're from like a pub culture background and that you know, they it's not it's you know it's a macho thing not to talk about emotions, feelings, sex in the bedroom, whatever. You know, we we need to open up about this stuff, and it, I, I feel like doing that is is really important to me. Yeah. And I'm so glad you do, Simon, because like you said, not many men will talk about it. But you know what? They might be listening in the cars on to on the way to work, and exactly just be there and share your story I have no doubt that you are helping so many people with your journey I think it's just amazing it's incredible I get emails every day I mean I show them to Michelle my wife as I, who's here as I say um, uh, every honestly every single day from people saying I, you know, I, 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 it blows my mind even now that I get all these messages saying you know, I've read your story and it's inspired me or I read something specific and it helped me or, or just asking me a question and looking for a bit of support or accountability. It, it's just mind-blowing that, that that's happened and that people are actually touched, inspired, helped by something I've shared or something I've said. And, uh, well, I never thought that would happen from quitting drinking, put it like that. It's amazing, isn't it, what can happen by, yeah. by just putting that glass down? Yeah, it is. And I think perhaps that's why people look at my story and sort of think, wow, you know, he's gone from there to writing a book and talking and all the rest of it. And it's it's great. It's just, I wouldn't change it for the world, put it like that. Oh, neither would we. Thank you so much, Simon. Yeah, thanks for being on. And just before you go, um, I just want to tell anyone that's listening, if you want to see Simon and you want to hear from him live, poor Michelle might not be quite in the picture because she might not want to, but 28th of March our event um, come along because Simon's uh, on the panel and I'm sure he'll be more than willing to talk about ADHD and sober sex all over again <laughs> oh 100% yeah well now we've talked about this it's going to be the main topic I'm going to make sure of it I think Michelle you're coming to that aren't you? yes yeah, Michelle's coming as well. So. Oh, that's lovely. Really really forward it. to it. I've met you once, Michelle, I think, at the um, yeah. Mindful Drinking Festival anyway, but it'd be nice to actually catch up and have a chat about Simon when he's not <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. See you later, Simon. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.